Welcome to Emerging Topics in Catholic Healthcare Ethics, Series 2, Session 2, titled Error, Conscience, and the Way of Medicine, a live webcast presented by the Catholic Health Association. I'm Nathaniel Blanton Hibner, Director of Ethics at CHA, and I will be the moderator for today's session. We are delighted to continue to offer this monthly webinar series to address critical ethical issues in caring for patients and families in Catholic hospitals, long-term care facilities, and medical centers nationwide. This webinar series is offered in partnership with Georgetown University, Loyola University Chicago, and St. Louis University. Before I introduce today's speaker, let's take a moment to pause and reflect. Loving God, May we see the plight of all those who suffer in our midst. Give us courage and compassion to live in solidarity with the suffering. May our hearts burning with love bear the burdens of all in our care. And may our loving example ignite the hearts of others to accompany the vulnerable in their affliction. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. We are very honored to be joined today by Dr. Alan Roberts, Professor of Clinical Medicine, Physician Executive Director for Inpatient Operations, and Associate Medical Director at MedStar at Georgetown University Medical Center. As a reminder, if you have questions for the presenter, please enter them in the Q&A module at the bottom center of your Zoom platform. And now I'll return it over to Dr. Roberts to begin this discussion. Welcome, Dr. Roberts. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be back. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And uh, it's always uh, uh, good to share um, among the household of faith and medicine in the common ground that, that we share with each other. So I'm going to talk today about error, conscience, and the way of medicine. I would like to say that my almost 40 year career in medicine has been error free. Um, unfortunately, I can't say that. And I don't think any practitioner can. Um, I'm gonna couch this as we get on in the talk to a, a philosophy of medicine, which has been recently written on and referred to as the way of medicine. So keep that um, rubric in mind as we go forward here. I'm gonna start with a brief reflection on Psalm 101. This is a Psalm of King David. And he says uh, here, I will ponder the way that is blameless. I will walk with integrity of heart within my house. Now, of course, in the original, uh, King David is writing about affairs of state when he refers to his house. Um, and as we know, things, did not go quite as everybody had planned in, uh, in the household of the affairs of state during his tenure. Similarly, uh, we extrapolate this to understand his own house. And as we know, things didn't go quite as planned within his own house. I don't think it's a stretch as we bring this forward. What does this have to do with us? Uh, I'm gonna think in terms of the house or the household of the profession of medicine. And so I want to ponder the way that is blameless, not that we're going to be free of error, but how is it that we can deal with medical error in a way which demonstrates integrity of heart within the household of medicine? So, of course, we always go to... Um, uh, Dr. Pellegrino, and I'm sure that if you're on the call, uh, you have heard the name of Edmund Pellegrino, uh, father, as we call him, of uh, modern medical ethics in the, the Catholic tradition. There is no writer which captures the heart of, uh, of, of Christianity, I think, in medicine as Dr. Pellegrino has. Now, he defines clinical medicine is the physician's locus ethicus, whose end is the right and good healing action and decision. The, the clinical encounter is where it all takes place. The goal of medicine, the telos of medicine, as he says, is the good 
healing action and decision. A heavy burden for doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals to carry. Except that, as Atul Gawande reminds us in his wonderful book of uh, 20 years ago now, uh, Complications, you have a cough. It's not science you call upon, but a doctor, a doctor with good days and bad days, a doctor with a weird laugh and a bad haircut, a doctor with three other patients to see, and inevitably gaps in what he knows and skills he's still trying to learn. So there does seem to be a distance between the telos of medicine on the one hand and the conduits of medicine on the other, that would be imperfect uh, physicians uh, and, uh, and others. So I'm gonna to review today ethics and medical error. This is, uh, there is a vast amount of literature uh, in recent years on this, uh, a blossoming in, particularly in the last five or six years that I will, I will speak to. And uh, first I'm gonna divide up into three sections here. First, I'm just gonna look very briefly at four cases of medical error. Um, we're gonna review the history, very uh, a, a simplified history of, of error in medicine as we deal with it. And then I'm gonna spend some time on the state of how medical error is handled today. In the second part, I will reflect on the state of medical error today. And then finally, we'll draw some conclusions about what, where are we now and what are the implications of, of this for the way of medicine as I'm going to call it. So to launch part one, let's talk briefly about conscience, fundamentally important conscience, uh, several definitions as we see it. In the dictionary, uh, the fa conscience is the faculty of recognizing the distinction between right and wrong in regard to one's conduct, coupled with a sense that one should act accordingly. Now the Christian Medical and Dental Association of which I'm a member of the ethics committee has stated that conscience is at the core of our nature as moral persons made in the image of God that enables us to understand moral truth based on the moral law that God has written on the human heart. Of course, drawing from the first chapter of Romans. And then uh, from Pellegrino again, he sees uh, conscience as manifesting in two ways in clinical care. And the first is in the moral duties of the physician patient relationship. And then second, in the moral obligation uh, the, the, the necessity of practicing good contemporary state-of-the-art medicine. So uh, again, Pellegrino was, was prescient in his writing. Uh, he, he passed away in 2013. Uh, and this was in the early days of, of the sort of how we view uh, medical error and how we deal with it today. So four cases. Um, the first case, is uh, it was um, uh, an incorrect prescription for warfarin, which is an anticoagulant. Uh, uh, the trade name is Coumadin. Um, the second case was a, a hemorrhagic shock, a very severe bleeding complication following a procedure to withdraw fluid from the abdomen of a patient with cirrhosis following a, a ear, nose, and throat surgery. The third case is the incorrect administration of chemotherapy. I'll stop right there and say that uh, I've been, uh, was personally involved in one way or the other in these first three uh, cases. Uh, the first was early in my career. Uh, the second was later on in my career uh, as an intensive care doctor. And the third was in my role of administrator as there was an incorrect administration of chemotherapy, uh, an improper administration, uh, the wrong route. Um, and uh, there was a bad outcome. And my role in this was to, to shepherd the process forward um, of, uh, of integrity and disclosure as best we understood it uh, so that the, uh, the best could be done for the patient's surviving family. Now, the fourth, fourth case we, we are all aware of is an unnerving case of a Nashville nurse who administered the wrong medication to a patient. Uh, the patient subsequently had a cardiac arrest, uh, suffered irreversible brain damage, and uh, ended up passing away. 
And the problem with this case, as we see it, was not that an error occurred or that it was disclosed, but that in the midst of this, there was a criminal charge of negligent homicide brought uh, and the, patient, the, 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 the nurse was uh, convicted. Uh, this changes the equation of how we, or I'd say potentially changes the equation of how things are handled in error today. Much publicity on this, and I'm gonna come back to this in a bit. Okay, so a brief history of medical error. I, I framed this in, in sort of a, a, a modern history context, Hippocrates. Uh, we turn to Hippocrates as uh, the, some refer to him as the father of, of medicine. Um, he's under a lot of attack today, uh, but, uh, but there's still a lot of good to be found in his writing. Uh, we'll call him the prophetic era, if you will. Then there's the patristic era, and uh, I will call this the paternalistic, if you will, integrity. Isn't that interesting? Paternalistic integrity of 19th and early 20th century medicine, followed by the dark ages, it seems, where there was concealment and blame and shame associated with medical error, um, and, and consequently a, a, a mentality of non-reporting of medical error. And then finally, we get into, oh, I'll call it the postmodern era of the just culture and its sequelae or its fallout, if you will. So let's go to Hippocrates briefly. Um, he actually wrote a fair amount about um, uh, error, uh, not uh, error as such, but it's, it's in there, it's overheard and, uh, and, and seen within his writing and the writing uh, that bears his name. Most of what is Hippocratic writing, it wasn't written by Hippocrates, but by a school of thought that went on for several centuries. And in Greece, we believe that Luke, the beloved physician, was trained in the Hippocratic tradition. There's some evidence uh, of that. But as we, uh, we read in Hippocrates, if the patient, for example, is overcome by an acute illness, well, that's not the physician's fault. Well, that's good news for us. On the other hand, if the physician treats the patient either incorrectly or out of ignorance and the patient is overcome, that is, they die, this is the physician's fault. <clears throat> so he also entertained the, the role of misfortune. That's the ancient and polite way of saying that, that stuff happens. Um, and he has a fairly extensive uh, litany of correct and incorrect practices in medicine and surgery. And, and so this, uh, the error and incorrect um, process and procedure is not foreign, even in the ancient writings of Hippocrates. We'll fast forward to William Osler, regarded by many to be the father of modern medicine. Uh, look for a moment uh, <clears throat> at, at Osler um, uh, here. Uh, all photographs of Osler uh, were with patients were of him looking not at us, but at the patient. Um, and he writes, this is the beginning of the era, by the way, when doctors were called to a very high standard of, of, of professionalism. And, and it was a, the era of the ascent of physicians in, in, the, in the social stratus of, um, or strata of the, uh, of the community in the state. So he says, begin to make a threefold category. In other words, he encouraged his students to keep notes and records of all their cases, threefold category, clear cases, doubtful cases, and mistakes. And he says, learn to play the game fair. No shrinking from the truth. Of course, he's speaking here of the diary that the doctors are going to, to keep. He says, have mercy for the other man, but none for yourself upon whom you have to keep an incessant watch. Okay, so this is implanted in this is, is good. It's the seeds of integrity, but does this integrity make its way into a, uh, a form of disclosure of error? And we, we know from Osler that he, he disclosed uh, the errors that he made, except when he didn't. Um, and uh, so look at this, of course, we've always, this is before HIPAA, this photograph, but we've all seen this patient. And um, and Osler did a lot of good, and he introduced to us uh, a, a rigorous self um, uh, self maintenance of, of worth for physicians uh, paradigm. 
Look now at one of his successors, Harvey Cushing, uh, uh, as Osler was looking his, at his patient, uh, Cushing in all of his pictures was looking at the camera, a uh, very much a posed picture. And uh, Cushing was Osler's biographer, and he also was a neurosurgeon, a very prominent and established neurosurgery as a specialty in his day, early years of the 20th century. And he encouraged open reporting of neurosurgical successes and failures. And he referred to allowable versus non-allowable oversights in neurosurgical practice. He really launched neurosurgery as a, as a cogent specialty. Now, much of, the, of, of what was reported was reported in his era in the public press. And this is the earliest uh, time of the public media getting into and talking about way before HIPAA medical error. Now, John Banja, who has written on medical errors and medical narcissism, uh, it's a less well-referenced book, but he does examine the, um, the role of, of uh, physicians as narcissists. Oh, say it ain't so. Um, but he talks about uh, that aspect of it. And what he claims is that for the past 50 years, physicians were advised by supervisors and risk managers not to disclose errors. Serious errors were occasionally disclosed, but he seems it overwhelmingly true that most harm causing errors during the 20th century were concealed. Now, I think this is a bit of reductionist uh, uh, thinking, but uh, to a large extent, it is uh, true. Moving forward into the 1950s, we begin to see comments like this. Okay, well, that errors were beginning to be acknowledged but under the veil of these errors are diseases of medical progress we see in the New England Journal in 1956. And medical errors are the price we pay for modern diagnosis and therapy. This in JAMA in 1955. So still reasonably paternalistic by today's uh, lens. But here, finally, in the, the early mid uh, 1960s, we see this in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Assessment of all untoward reactions, regardless of severity, is essential to determine their total incidence and to indicate the cumulative risk assumed by the patient exposed to the many drugs and procedures used in his care. Well, this is pretty cool. All of a sudden, the profession begins to take note of medical error as a problem. The hospital is beginning to be seen as the unsafe place that it was and is. Of course, Dr. Schimmel here took a lot of static for this paper, but it was prescient and important. Things move pretty slowly. So again, 30 years later, 30 plus years later, it seems that uh, there were two quiet publications out there indicating that that 98% of surveyed patients desired disclosure of medical mistakes and would be less likely to sue if they were informed. And then in the Veterans Association, Veterans of Health Organization in 1995, they began to see a benefit in terms of, of, uh, of financial risk uh, avoidance if errors are disclosed. The medical center will will inform the family and the patient as appropriate of the erroneous event, assure them that medical measures have been implemented and that additional steps are being taken to minimize disability, death and inconvenience or financial loss to the patient and family. Now this, see, this is like, uh, you know, that's just before the turn of the century. Most of us remember this time. And it's interesting to me that it, it, it really took that long to, to get to the point of acknowledgement that not only is is disclosure the right thing to do morally, but also it has a, a secondary financial benefit to those who may see only that aspect of it. Well, the big wake up call, the moment of truth in medical error was in the Institute of Medicine report also in 1999, landmark paper pivotal in our culture. Institute of Medicine, <clears throat> the report to err is human building a safer health system. And this was a staggering report. 
that indicated that between 44 and 98,000 error-related in-hospital deaths occurred each year in the US. And that medical error was estimated as the eighth leading cause of death in the United States. This was an attention getter. Everything stopped when this thing came out. Um, and then in 2016, there was a revised estimate, and I put a star here because the, the definition by the uh, definition of medical error by 2016 had expanded. What qualified uh, uh, as, as, and got measured was a broader uh, set of items than uh, in, in 1999. But the revised estimate uh, allowing for that methodology uh, variance uh, was up to uh, 400,000 deaths per year in the hospital and that medical error is the third leading cause of death in the U.S. So by way of practical definitions uh, in the Institute of Medicine, error is defined as a failure of a planned action to be completed as intended or use of a wrong plan to achieve an aim. The accumulation of errors results in accidents. And then in, uh, in a paper from uh, uh, not too long after that, uh, defining medical error, an act of omission or commission planning or execution that contributes or could contribute to an unintended result. So this is actually a pretty good definition. In other words, we don't want to measure only errors that finally resulted in a bad outcome. We want to know about medical errors that could contribute to an unintended result or a bad outcome. This is from the Institute of Medicine report. One second. <clears throat> the types of errors, the categories of errors that the IOM found fell into diagnostic, uh, delay in diagnosis, failure to implement, uh, to employ the right tests, outmoded tests, et cetera, failure to act on results. That's an important one. So diagnostic, another category of treatment, errors in treatment, performance of an operation, administering the medication, the wrong dose of the medication, an avoidable delay in treatment, okay? Next category would be preventive, failure to provide uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, for example, or inadequate monitoring or follow-up of treatment. And finally, other, a failure of communication, equipment failure, system failure. So this was as reported in the IOM uh, text. Now the Institute of Medicine goal in their report was to establish national focus, to create leadership research tools and protocols to enhance the knowledge base about safety. So finally, systematically, systemically, organizationally, the profession of medicine, as it is moving now into uh, uh, hospital and medical corporations, is beginning to take medical error really seriously. To identify and learn from errors through immediate and strong mandatory reporting efforts, okay? Including self-reporting, right? So. Uh, if there's a medical error now, in fact, the Joint Commission and all the other uh, external organizations in, in DC, it's the DC Department of Health, looks very carefully at our reporting system and structure and response. Okay, the third goal of the IOM was to raise standards and expectation for improvements in safety at the organizational group purchasers and professional groups. So professional organizations, third party payers, et cetera. And finally, to create safety systems inside healthcare organizations through the implementation of safe practices at the delivery level. I retired from the Navy in 2003 and came to Georgetown then and, uh, and witnessed the, the implementation in the early uh, years of this century of these very things at the organizational hospital and bedside level. It's been very satisfying to see this get off the ground. It remains imperfect, but it is in place. Now, uh, James Reason has uh, 
written extensively on medical error. His thing is that you can, you can have just enough system checks and balances and controls. And yet if the holes in the Swiss cheese line up, somehow the error can happen. So we refer to this all the time as the Swiss cheese effect. If in spite of all of our best preventive efforts, things go through the cracks. We can't ignore the human condition, can't change the human condition, he says, but we can change the conditions under which humans work. So we put in place safeguards and barriers. And there's failures though. There's active failures, which are unsafe acts. And there are latent failures, which have to do with embedded practices and presumptions. And it's the way we've always done it, if you will, that lead to uh, a risk uh, or, or setting, setting up someone to, uh, uh, to commit a medical error. Well, what has turned out of this is, uh, <clears throat> and this goes to risk management in a given hospital now, is that in contemporary practice, there is in most organizations, and certainly in the one I work for, a, a standard practice for communication and resolution program. And this means that there is transparency with the patient and their family or surrogates through early, open, and honest communication with patient and family. There's dedication to reporting and investigation of an event. And these events may be tiered as to serious safety events, used to be called sentinel events versus non-serious safety events, but safety events notwithstanding. There's a commitment to equ equitable and fair resolution when patient harm was deemed to have been preventable. And this includes apology, we shall return to this. And finally, prevention of future harm through learning and improvement. So this is, this is contemporary practice. This is the IOM report of 1999 brought forward. And this was written on by our own risk management chief, uh, uh, Larry Smith and others uh, just a couple of years ago. The hierarchy of reporting, serious safety events at the very top, mandatory reporting and public disclosure. This all goes, this is a joint commission thing. It's a, it's a Department of Health jurisdictional thing. Um, and then there are the near misses or lesser injuries. And this means voluntary reporting. Now, um, where I work, there is, if you go on the website of the hospital, there is a pathway, you just a couple of clicks. And, and uh, pretty soon you get to a page where you can report an event and including self-reporting. Uh, Self-reporting has gone way up. If someone, uh, 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 even if it's a, uh, an error that doesn't reach the level of the patient, uh, people still go in. We see this all the time. Hey, I went in there. I, I entered an order on the wrong patient. I discovered it. I corrected it. Did not reach patient. So good. So it's an era of, of, uh, of full disclosure and, and honesty. It's a, it's a place of much more integrity. Is it comprehensive and perfect? Of course not, but it is really quite a step in the right direction. Now I include this uh, slide not to, not to go through this, uh, except to say that what it doesn't show, this is the, the sort of risk management uh, uh, algorithm for how a event, uh, an event is reported. It's a potential serious safety event. Um, if yes, then we, notif we notify uh, for communication, resolution, et cetera, system safety team, we hold the bills. Uh, and if it's confirmed serious safety event, then we waive the entire bill or the system waives, excuse me, the entire bill. Well, you don't see anything here in this algorithm about how we, we work with patients. So this is actually uh, takes a step away from how we, work directly with patients and their families. Yes, they are touched by it. Um, it impacts them as, as far as a financial burden is concerned, if there was a serious safety event. But what's missing from this is that the patient is, should be, I think, center stage. For what it is, this is not a bad thing, but we're gonna return to this uh, absence in a minute. Now, disclosure in practice and training. I've been party uh, to many disclosures of error over time. 
um, it, there is literature on this. There's a disconnect in what we do between what patients want and need and what physicians are comfortable providing. Not all physicians are at ease. Well, it's not an easy thing really to sit down and say, you know what, we, there was an error here and this is what happened. There's a discrepancy between what attendings and residents would hypothetically disclose versus what they rep actually report that they have disclosed. Yes, disclosure seems like a good thing. Have you ever disclosed? Well, maybe not that often, sort of thing. Now, this is maybe one of the most important takeaways from this body of literature that I saw, that physicians in training were more likely to practice disclosure of error if they had witnessed disclosure by their mentors. How dreadfully important is mentorship? We shall return to this also. We'll also note, and there's literature on this, that medical school and graduate medical education curricula are largely devoid of error disclosure training. And that was le recent literature, by the way. Now, apology, part of apology has worked its way in. Apology has worked its way into the disclosure process. And I'll talk about how we do this. But we also know that as we all know from our personal lives, a bad apology is worse than no apology at all. There's, there's the neologism, a non-apology. That's like, well, you know, I am sorry something happened to you. Okay, that's a non-apology, right? And then I live in Washington, DC. And of course, this is Washington, DC, where there's the DC apology. So for example, I regret that you feel that you were somehow harmed. Okay, that's a DC apology. Now, uh, the, the literature on the mal impact on malpractice risk uh, is mixed, but in general, there is a sense uh, and, and some papers are just unequivocal about this, that the risk of litigation, the risk of your patient filing a lawsuit drops way down with the right and sincere disclosure and apology. In law, a full apology law protects statements of regret and disclosure um, from, you know, if, if, can you uh, discover and bring as evidence an apology? Um, there's a handful of states that have full apology laws. Uh, there's uh, more states that have partial apology laws, which protect if, if I express regret, a Washington DC apology, uh, they protect that from uh, being brought in as, as evidence. So apology has made its uh, way sort of into law. Now, apology for error. There's literature on this. Um, uh, healing benefit of apology, there's restoration of the patient's dignity, there's restoration of trust in the physician, uh, restoration of power and the power differential between physician and patient, healing for the offender. Um, and, and we'll talk about that. Validation that an offense occurred, acknowledgement. Yes, we have to say this. The designation of fault when someone is at fault or if there were system errors. Restoration of dialogue. An apology can begin to restore communications. An affirmation of shared values, reparations, and then assurance of corrective action. I will tell you that the, the, on any number of times where I've been party to a, dis, a disclosure process, the patient uh, or family will simply say, I just don't want this to happen to anybody else ever. Now, the structure of an apology is the, uh, we usually, uh, and, and process, these are all intertwined. We usually uh, disclose something that, that something has happened early on, perhaps the same hour or day. And then we, part of that conversation is the assurance uh, that we will be looking into this. There is a, a group in the hospital that does look into how this could have happened. And we will get back with a definite closeout report on our findings for you and your family. Acknowledgement that the offense occurred when appropriate. We acknowledge that there was someone who committed the offense. We provide explanation. 
we do express remorse and humility and we factor in a way of reparation. So this uh, structure of apology is nuanced. It has to be done by people who are uh, more senior than the intern, I would say, who perhaps had some training and experience in this mentorship, if you will. Now, anybody who has committed a medical error um, uh, is considered now under, under many programs to be the second victim. You know, we suffer. Uh, it, one, anybody who's, who's committed a complication, uh, been involved in a complication or committed an error, uh, you know, it's so uh, internally, um, hopefully if we're worth our salt, this, this weighs on us. Uh, there's data for of significant emotional trauma following errors and adverse events. Uh, there's a perception that the organization does not support people. Uh, and there are individual barriers to seeking support. Boy, these are nuanced. They're psychological. They may be financial, et cetera. And we've tried to mitigate this in recent years by, um, by the care for the caregiver programs. Uh, this, is this, is, this, this requires training. Clinicians go through training on how to support their fellow clinicians when an error has been committed and help them through the disclosure process and the, the coming to terms process. Um, we, we offer, um, or it can be offered as off the record and off the books, uh, you know, psychological you know, counseling for, uh, for providers who have, uh, who have erred or committed errors, comp had complications. And then for those who have been sued, there is the You Are Not Alone program where uh, colleagues and, uh, and professionals will, will uh, gather around, so to speak, figure of speech, around someone who has been sued to walk with them through this process. Well, let's not forget that out there is the whole problem of race and gender-based disparities in healthcare. Uh, and uh, this is from JAMA in 1990. And the value of this paper lamentably is in its uh, historic testimony that so little has been accomplished to mitigate uh, racial disparities in medicine over these 32 years. Well, it turns out that um, uh, in, uh, in 2022 in the, uh, the Boston University Law Review, they uh, documented uh, considerable, I won't go through all of this, but you know, a huge amount of, of ethnic minorities at greater risk in a diagnostic test implementation. They were at greater risk of an adverse event, twice as likely to experience harm and underdiagnosis specifically in depression in African-Americans or stroke in women and patients under 45 years of age in those groups. Um, and that, that there are a number of communities, women, racial minorities, LGBTQ communities at greater risk of error. The good news is, uh, and this from the Annals of Internal Medicine, the American College of Physicians issued this paper serendipitously the same week as the verdict was handed down uh, in the George Floyd um, a homicide trial uh, to the, uh, uh, the, the police involved. And this is a commitment from the American College of Physicians to begin a systematic uh, e evaluation and, and rectification process for mitigating uh, healthcare disparities based on race and, and uh, other factors. So to return briefly, the wrong dose of an anticoagulant, I wrote the wrong dose on a prescription pad in the mid 1980s. It reached the patient, the patient suffered no harm. Uh, we disclosed, I was a resident at the time, we disclosed uh, the event. Um, it was not easy uh, to do. Uh, they were livid and rightly so, but we did it. We assumed uh, uh, full responsibility and there was no long-term outcome. That was a learning experience for me. And I'm glad that happened for me, not for the patient, because I learned a lot from that early career disclosure process. Paracentesis, a drainage procedure leading to hemorrhage. This led to the, um, uh, a severe 
uh, adverse outcome for the patient. Um, and we went through a disclosure process. Uh, he had end-stage liver disease and the family was most understanding. We also went through an educational process of how to do this better in similar patients. Incorrect administration of chemotherapy. This also led to a, a bad outcome. Um, and the disclosure process was, uh, was, was uh, difficult, but necessary. And it, um, it went about as well as it could have under the circumstances. Now, the problem with the unnerving story of the Nashville nurse is what will this do to um, impede reporting of error and self-reporting if there is known to be a homicide detective lurking in the wings? Um, fortunately uh, for the, the, the individual involved, the sentence was light. But the problem that I see in this is that one of the problems is that there were a number of organizations that, that went uh, publicly uh, on this um, and all had to do with the individual nurse involved. And the ones I read, not one of them referred to the actual death of the patient. There is the second victim to be sure, but there is also the first victim. Now, lastly, here I mention the blistering encounter with a family member. We are seeing a sad rise in workplace violence and bullying from, uh, by, by visitors, uh, even pre-COVID and now certainly more so during COVID. If you have been, the uh, say, in uh, having received a full bore harangue from a patient family member who is threatening and bullying and behavior, and then you go into the next patient's room and try to do things exactly right. Well, it's psychologically, it's also a setup for error. This is not well written on in the literature, and it is something that will impact us in the days and years ahead. I want to reflect very briefly as we wrap up here. Reflection on this. Just culture. Patient safety is a central goal. Human error will occur. Medical error is costly. And system design is crucial in minimizing error, no question. What we see in system design is a just distribution of accountability by standardization of error management. And retributive justice is supplanted by restorative justice. Okay, this is good, this is laudable. That is in all things, what would Dr. Pellegrino say? Pellegrino reminds us that the moral nature of medical error is present and retains, he retains the notion of blame, accountability, and responsibility individually, professionally. The first principle, says Pellegrino, in both system and individual clinical encounter must be the primacy of the good of the patient that the patient should be, who died in, in Nashville should be left out of the, um, uh, the indignation of professional organizations is, is problematic as he might see it. Detection and prevention of medical error has its ethical foundation in the duty to act for the good of the sick and to avoid harm for patients. Blameworthy error, says Pellegrino, is one in which there is a failure for which moral accountability can be assigned. The only blame-free error is one which occurs despite all preventive measures being done and done properly. A preventable adverse action is a moral failure that cannot be exculpated by the blame-free approach advocated by proponents of the system dimensions of error. Ultimately, virtue, all our medical principles, uh, this is Ed Pellegrino, um, that uh, everything really hinges on, on the virtue of the provider, the vir virtue of the physician. I'm gonna be careful to say physician here. Um, that, uh, that, that the moral effectiveness of all of our principles really turns on a physician's virtue. And that virtue means integrity, and that integrity means the willingness to assume blame and to be responsible for the right disclosure, which then becomes part of the good and healing action. 
The clinical encounter is the physician's locus ethicus. Personal integrity is a person's commitment to live a moral life. The woman or man of integrity is honest, reliable, without hypocrisy. He or she will admit mistakes, be remorseful, and accept the guilt that follows wrongdoing. And the person of integrity fulfills the obligations of his private and his professional life, which are consistent with each other. We'll wrap it up here briefly. I just want to talk about this book. I commend this book to you, The Way of Medicine by Carlin and Tollefson. Are we serving our patients best by a provider of services? We could do the bidding of a patient, regardless of what that bidding is, or by the way of medicine, which carries the burden of integrity and, um, uh, and faithfulness to the, uh, to the natural law and to, and to moral theology. Now here's a wrinkle, okay? Physician-assisted suicide. It's coming across the country. It's only in a handful of states right now in the District of Columbia, sadly. But within a given jurisdiction, and here we have at the bottom right, we have the Oregon experience that more and more people are availing themselves of medical aid in dying since uh, it became legal in the late 90s. However, we are beginning to see literature on medical error in medical aid in dying and physician-assisted suicide. For example, what percent of patients who are administered the death cocktail have a successfully desired death? What are the adverse events? Vomiting, prolonged dying, unanticipated awakening, adverse medication effect, someone called EMS. Is medical aid in dying equitably, equitably available in the community by race and gender and disability? Uh, is there prevention of coercion of ethnic minorities or the disabled within society? Is, uh, is there integrity in the scope of medical aid in dying? Is there a fragmentation of the profession? Regulatory, lack of standard data collection. And the conclusion here is that there is a call for standard reporting to ensure the safety of medical aid in dying. This is, in my mind, just a bizarre place to be. And the problem here is that in the ethical and religious directives, as we know, as Pellegrino wrote, and as the way of medicine affirms, medical aid in dying is by its very nature an, uh, an immoral act. Uh, and the risk of systematizing and making reporting and regulation and process, lending that those things to medical aid in dying also lends legitimacy to an otherwise immoral practice. And so you see the slippery slope here of where we go with an unchecked uh, process approach, systems of programmatic approach uh, to medical error. So finally, conscience, integrity, and the way of medicine occurs at the level of the individual physician, at the organization level, and the level of the profession. So in the earlier Psalm I quoted, I did leave out the, the middle part of that verse. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Oh, when will you come to me? So in the middle of our uh, medical practice, we, we deeply desire to know that a way that is blameless, to walk with integrity of heart within our house, but we also long for the day when all things are put to rights. All right, I thank you very much and uh, happy to entertain a few questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts, uh, for your comments, for the, the history of kind of this situation around errors and the way we approach them in medicine, et cetera, um, and a little bit around the practical um, kind of tools that now exist around reporting and the way that that culture has changed. We have a few questions and a little bit of time to go through it, uh, but I like, I like to get a little started. If you could discuss a little bit about, it seems as if not only is the patient and physician relationship 
one built around obviously honesty and trust, but it also appears that for this to be successful for that model of reporting, that there needs to be a sense of honesty and trust between the physicians and the organization in which they serve, right? You don't wanna have some sort of over reprimand, you know, reprimand when people wanna come and report. So could you describe a little bit about the patient organization trust that's needed in order for this kind of process to move forward? I wanna make sure I understand your, your question. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, but if I'm not hitting it, just let me know. So for the last 15 or 17 years in our, in our own organization facility, uh, there is just a, a huge daily emphasis uh, on, uh, on uh, reporting medical error. Uh, and I mean, reporting it to the system. It is vetted uh, by, we, we have each hospital now and in our organization, uh, MedStar, has a, uh, a center for patient safety, um, works very closely with uh, the, uh, the risk management department. The two go hand in hand. They are inseparable now. It's the way it is. Um, but uh, every patient complaint does get uh, vetted and, and looked at, and, uh, and there has to be closure on it. Uh, if it's something like a, uh, like a medication error doesn't get to the patient, we deal with it. Um, anything that does reach the patient, there does uh, have to be a, a type of disclosure by the right people. Um, and so, you know, built into the, into the mindset, at least where I work, I think there's a very healthy notion of, of forthrightness uh, and also a, a lack of, uh, or a, a uh, the, the free ability to uh, report without fear of retribution. We have policies in place that, that protect people from uh, uh, retribution for you know, doing their job and reporting. Now, in terms of the patient and family, depending on the nature of the error and whether it reached the patient, and whether it caused harm to the patient and was it avoidable. All these things need to be disclosed uh, and disclosed in a way that is A, right for the patient and also accountable to the, to the um, I think to the moral authority and agency of the organization. Uh, so if I am going to, you know, I, if, if I, for example, have a complication uh, and a procedure which results in the harm of the patient, my, my first thing is to go and my first obligation, I'm, I'm old fashioned. My first obligation is to, to go to the patient and say, listen, this is what happened. And, and, and I, we don't know all the reasons that it happened, uh, but we're gonna find out. We're gonna take good care of you and uh, we're with you through this. And we will come back tomorrow, the next day, a week later and give you the results of our, our full report. If you take, for example, the case of the inappropriate uh, administration of chemotherapy, it turns out that when that was investigated uh, by independent, I mean, I, the, the, the involved physicians can't be the investigators, it has to be independent group looking through the whole thing. There were a, a series of, of staffing issues, scheduling issues, um, and, and, and available uh, you know, pharmacy issues, all of which contributed to the human error of one individual hematology person. And so before we go in and say, it is this person's fault, there is a responsibility here. We need to find out what are the contributing factors. And, and, and to not do so is not only inaccurate, but it's not it does not possess integrity. I don't know if I, if I answered the question or not. Oh, I think you did very well, thank you. Um, I think it really shows a little bit, you know, when you were discussing how an apology has certain parts to it, but certainly one of the major parts is about action. It's about going back and providing some sort of resolution um, to the situation. So, and hoping yeah. that you, you fix whatever holes exist so that you prevent future similar situations from arising. I think, uh, right, and, and uh, just, just one further comment. I think that 
that, that there is a lot of good. Yes, are people worried about saving money on litigation? Of course they are, that's reality. Um, uh, but I do think there is a good faith effort to do right by the patient, you know, even at the corporate level. So, you know, which, um, one of the questions we've just got in involves the joint commission and mm -hmm. wanted to know how their annual initiative around national patient safety goals and zero harm, this campaign uh, might be uh, a support, might be influenced in the way that your hospital or other hospitals are responding to this, this yeah. question. So everybody, you know, if, if the, as everybody knows, if, if the Joint Commission says jump, we say how high as we're going up. And, um, uh, and so uh, I, I don't know specifically the, the details of that uh, requirement. I do know that um, the, the, our internal program, I think will meet the, uh, the requirement. The, the, the Joint Commission gets, um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, they they um, they are an, an ever present force, um, and we are aware that on any given day they may show up and say, "How did you do this? How did you handle that?" Um, I'm not terribly worried about the processes we have in place. Um, uh, the, if anything, they're going to uh, they're going to look for a non-reporting uh, of a serious safety event. If something happens, uh, either uh, technically, medically, or even ethically, there are certain criteria for which anybody, a patient, a family member, can call the Joint Commission and put us on report. Uh, and uh, we saw one of those just not, not too long ago. And it turns out that with the right, uh, uh, the right people, we can identify if there was an error made um, and, and how we're going to disclose it and how we are accountable to the Joint Commission. Thank you. Um, one more question before we, we wrap up and I'm kind of combining a couple of them together, but you know, in your storied experience in your long career in healthcare, you know, how have you seen kind of this rise of technology such as the internet, for example, um, as well as our cultural shift towards mistrusting of experts? Um, how do you, how have you, have you seen, uh, maybe a rise in patients saying that there was an error or in patients asking, wait a minute, was that the right choice that you, you know, medicine you prescribed or, you know, mm -hmm. how, how has that kind of development in technology and in culture shifted the way that medicine is practiced and the way we, uh, we deal with error today? Okay. So I guess a couple of things, uh, the, uh, I have a, a coffee mug somewhere that says something to the effect of do not confuse your Google search with my medical degree. Okay, so a little bit of, you know, old fashioned, you know, paternalism there. We have uh, before us a, a much more informed public. Um, and also we have a public that is a postmodern public that is uh, skeptical of the meta narrative of um, of, of medicine uh, that we inherited from my father's generation. My father was a general practitioner who practiced from 1933 to 1986. Um, and and it, early in his career, it was the physician's way. It was, they would tell you what the plan was. There was not quite the autonomy. And over his career, uh, the medicine learned to walk with you know, authoritative expertise, but in step with individual uh, patient autonomous choices. And then later, of course, we have the internet and a much more informed public. So do we have, are we seeing a more skeptical, more educated, well-read uh, public being more skeptical, or I would say, in a good way critical of our um, recommendations? The answer of course is yes. I do think that, the, uh, that there is something to, and this is a Pellegrino thing also, there is something to uh, the beneficence of medicine walking in balance with the autonomy of the patient. 
I don't think we are serving our patients by walking in and giving them a list of options and say, pick one. Um, they can do their Google search. They can, you know, it's easy to do that, but it's simply the wrong thing. I think we are jettisoning, jettisoning our, our duty, our integrity, if we don't say to them, here are the things that are possible, five options, and of these, I favor this one, and here's why. And to go through this with them. And part and parcel of that is, and here are the risks attendant with this. And what are the complications attendant to this? To fully disclose a full, you know, full patient autonomy is not autonomy if it is not uh, a fully educated autonomy with the ability to process that education. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Roberts, for your presentation, for your comments, uh, and for everyone here listening uh, for your questions and participation. We very much appreciate your time. All right. I wish to announce the upcoming session in our series two of emerging topics in healthcare ethics will be on Wednesday, September 7th from 1 to 1.45 p.m. Eastern time. Please be on the lookout for details about this session and the upcoming ethics webinar sessions uh, in your email and on our website. I'm also delighted to once again announce our new program called Catholic Ethics for Healthcare Leaders. It's a seven week series, which will begin September 6. The new virtual course is designed for mission leaders, chaplains, clinicians, social workers, sponsors, anyone within Catholic healthcare who would like to deepen their understanding of Catholic ethics and our moral tradition. There is a link uh, in the chat box. If you have not already done so, please visit our website and download our ethics app, which gives you a convenient resources in the palm of your hand, as well as the ethical and religious directives that are easily there uh, whenever you need it. And finally, I ask as always, that you complete the survey, which is linked in the chat box uh, before you log out, because this helps us not only to understand the needs that you have, then that we are meeting them, but to get your suggestions for any future topics. Once again, I thank you so much for participating and attending. I look forward to next month's webinar with you all then. Have a good day.